I graduated from a Sam Houston State University in Texas back in the early 2000s. Like most college students, I had definitely encountered a handful of weird and quirky individuals, but none I'd remember like Bart. Bart wasn't his real name, it was Thomas, but since he had the middle name of Bartlett, he went by Bart because it suited him better. And boy did it ever. He had a mischievous streak that was a mile wide and often verged on criminal. At best, he was the life and soul of the party. At worst, he seemed downright dangerous. Sometimes he got it into his head that certain people were just out to get him, and he always talked about his parents like they were the two evil tyrants in his life, when it was common knowledge that they spoiled him rotten with cars, gifts, and a free ride through college. One time, when this one kid made him mad, Bart broke into the guy's dorm and tried to steal his computer. I think he only dodged getting kicked out of school after he convinced everyone, including the victim, that it was just kind of a prank gone wrong. But we all knew the truth. He really had wanted to hurt that kid. I just didn't think he had an actual violent bone in his body. But as it turned out, he actually kind of did. I remember he asked me out of the blue one time, How much money would it take for you to kill someone? We were always asking each other dumb questions like that. Like, who'd win between a bear and a lion? Weird, would-you-rather questions that were usually pretty not safe for work. So as much as I didn't take the question seriously, I still gave a moment's worth of thought. I remember telling him I wasn't sure. That it'd have to be at least half a million. But then he looks all annoyed and asks, You wouldn't kill someone for ten grand? I responded, God no, dude. It'd have to be like retirement money. He comes back with, 20 grand? I just laughed the question off at that point, but then he just ups it by 10 grand at a time until I gave him a definite no. A few moments of silence go by while he thinks, then he says, 50. I'd give you 50. I'm literally about to ask him why he's obsessing when someone else appeared and called out to us and Bart dropped the issue. I remember thinking it was a weird question to begin with, but the way he asked it was even weirder. Almost like he was really thinking about trying to hire a hitman or something. But we always talked about dumb stuff like that, so I guess I just forgot about it after a while. Sometime later, Bart drops out of college for some reason. Probably something to do with the fact that he barely did any of the work, and that was pretty much the last we saw of him. I mean, we keep in touch every so often, planning to do stuff but never actually doing it. Then this one time... Bart is texting my roommate who in turn tells me that Bart was saying he was going to come visit, only he was serious this time. He said he was about to get his hands on some trust fund of his parents that he had kept safe for him, and how he'd pay for us all to go down to Mexico for spring break the following year. I'm like, cool. I didn't believe he'd actually come visit, but I figured maybe a cash injection might help him get his butt into gear. Bart never did come to visit though and we found out why when my roommate called me into his bedroom to show me something on his computer. Bart's entire family had been killed, and he'd been shot in the arm in what seemed like a home invasion gone wrong. We tried calling him a bunch, but he didn't answer his phone, so we figured he either wasn't out of the hospital yet, or he just wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone, which I found perfectly understandable at the time. I can't even imagine how devastated I'd be if something like that happened to my family. Then, over the course of a few months, the truth came out. It started when Bart was arrested. We were just confused at first, but the only thing we could think of was that the cops had somehow found drugs or something else illegal in Bart's possession while searching his home. I mean, we knew he'd been shot in the arm, we'd seen it on the news, and they had a suspect in custody who'd fired all ten shots or whatever, so why arrest Bart? Long story short, they arrested Bart because the cops found out he actually knew the home invader. Then once they checked his phone, they found text messages from the same guy where Bart was arranging for the guy to kill his own family. They even talked about how the guy would need to shoot Bart to make it look authentic and how the shooter had to make sure his entire family was dead otherwise he wouldn't get paid out of the inheritance. I knew Bart was crazy, 
and I knew he could be a little impulsive sometimes, but dear God, to have your own parents murdered in such a horrifyingly elaborate way. I had no idea he was evil too. And that's what freaks me out about it. You'd never have guessed that Bart was capable of something like that. At least I didn't want to believe he was. I heard one of his parents actually survived and begged the state not to put him on death row. They succeeded too, so I guess that's some small silver lining from a horrifying little episode in my life. In my senior year of college, me and my boyfriend at the time lived in an off-campus apartment on the third floor of this big old townhouse. In the mud room slash closet area right by the door was where we kept our cat's litter box. Now most people can tell you that unless it's right after your cat uses the box, it doesn't smell like poop. Usually just the cat litter smell. Clay, Febreze, whatever it is. So for about a week I noticed it smelled like death in that little corner and I tore the area apart and the rest of the apartment looking for rogue turds but found absolutely nothing. Then right in the middle of the mystery stink ordeal, I had to leave for a week to go on a work trip. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a welcome break from what was massively a disgusting little problem. And I quite openly hoped that my boyfriend might get the whole thing fixed before my return. But to my horror, it only got worse with my boyfriend texting me one night with the bad news that the smell seemed to have spread into the hallway outside. I felt bad for him, but there was nothing much I could do other than advise him to just call the landlord and see what she could make out of it. He says okay, and he'll call her in the morning and keeps me updated on everything that happens. The next morning I'm getting texts off of him like every 20 minutes, stuff like, just called landlady and she's on her way. Then I get stuff like, she thinks it's coming from another apartment. Then, okay, it's definitely coming from another apartment. Which I was kind of relieved about, but oh my god, was that jumping the gun because things were about to get way, way worse. The last text I get is, she just called the cops. I reply with, please don't tell me someone died next door to us. Then my boyfriend starts typing, but then stops. I go into full panic mode, trying to work out what it might be because I can't face the thought that our neighbor actually died, and we were living next to a corpse for like weeks, and partially because we were the jerks and didn't check on her. Then after about an hour, my worst fears are confirmed. The landlady gave some cop permission to bust the door down, and when he did, my boyfriend said he and the landlady literally ran from the site that greeted them. Our neighbor's dead body was lying there, face down in the hallway, with one arm out like they were reaching for the door when they fell. That piece of hallway ran perfectly adjacent to our mudroom, where we keep the cat's litter tray, which is why it smelled the worst there and out in the hallway. The whole time I've been thinking to myself, freaking cat, shaking my head and scrubbing the floor, and there had been a dead body just on the other side of the wall, not even two or three feet away. We always keep up with our neighbors now, even if they're more than capable of looking after themselves. Having that network, that kind of community, you don't realize how important it is until it's far too late. In the summer of 2006, I was offered a place to study history at Bangor University in North Wales. It wasn't my first choice of uni, but I always wanted to move away for university. I mean, that's half the point of the whole thing, isn't it? See new places, meet new people, expand and enrich your intellect and all that. Bangor wasn't exactly Manchester or Birmingham, but there was something very quaint about having such relatively prestigious university built into such a small and storied town. In the end, I only lived in Bangor for the better part of a year, as I ended up dropping out due to family problems. But my brief time there yielded a variety of different experiences, some I'll always remember and some I wish I could forget. So, much like most other students at that age, 
university brought a desire for, well, experimentation. And after I partook in a few puffs of the wise man's mint, as one of my mates called it, I decided that, yeah, it was something I was going to get into. I didn't take to drinking all that much, too much puking, and the hangovers just weren't worth it. But smoking up in a circle packed with intelligent, thoughtful people, that was a different kettle of fish entirely. Alright, most of the stuff we talked about was just absolute nonsense, which prompted nothing but a descent into giggles. But it was fun, and on top of that, you weren't a soulless, dehydrated husk the next morning. So one morning, I get talking to this local lad called Ricky. Ricky had grown up in Bangor, but wasn't academic enough for university. However, that didn't stop him from walking up into the student areas to take advantage of the student-priced pubs, which is how I got talking to him. Eventually, the conversation got on to smoke and where I could get my hands on some. The local dealers didn't always trust the students, and even when they did, the chances that they'd just rip you off, assuming you were spending mummy and daddy's money, was very high indeed. Which is why Ricky's promise of, I'll get some for you, was like music to my ears. I took his number down, told him I'd give him a text sometime, then finished up my pint, lost my game of pool, then wandered back to Hall's. The next day, I gave Ricky a text, and we arranged to meet outside a block of flats on the other side of town. This seemed a bit risky, as it was in the lower portion of Bangor, where the locals lived, and not up on the hill where most of the lecture rooms and halls were. But Ricky seemed like a nice enough bloke. I considered myself fairly streetwise, and with me having no other connections, I figured why not. So, I went to meet him, gave him my last twenty quid, then stood outside the flats while we went off to ring one of the buzzers. Now, I'm not completely soft, so I actually end up peering over my shoulder to get a peek of which one he's ringing, just in case anything goes awry. The door opens, he says, back in a minute, and walks inside. A minute goes by, no sign of Ricky. Two minutes go by, still no sign of Ricky. After 15 minutes of standing outside those flats like an absolute plant pot, I tried calling him, but as you can probably guess, he didn't answer his phone. I drop him a few texts like, WTF is going on in there? And again, I get no replies. Obviously, I'm absolutely furious, thinking, I can't believe I'm actually getting mugged off here. And there's absolutely no effing chance that I'm about to just walk away without kicking off, so I march up to the little keypad near the front door of the flats and start buzzing the same button Ricky pushed. Hello? Some voice buzzes over the intercom. Uh, yeah. I'm a mate of Ricky's. He's got something of mine he needs to give back. Who? The fellow on the other end was obviously playing dumb. Look, mate. I've just seen him go into your flat so you can either let me in... Or I'll come back later with my cousins and we can see what happens. It was a pure bluff. My cousins were like 60 miles away, but it worked. There was a brief silence, and then the door buzzed open. I walk right up the stairs to flat three, knock on the door, and someone instantly answers it. A lad about my age who's keeping the door closed over because Ricky is evidently hiding inside. Mate, I know Ricky is here. And he's got something in mind, so... He was here. Yeah. The lad cuts me off. But he's just gone out the back. Said he'd be back in a few minutes. Then I hear a voice that obviously belongs to someone older saying, Let him wait inside if he wants. The lad looks off to the right, then opens up the door. I walk in to see about three or four guys, again about my age, and one older balding bloke hair down to his shoulders with this big thick stash. In front of him, on this dirty wooden coffee table is almost every kind of illegal substance you can imagine, and after waiting there for another 15 minutes, tension rising the whole time, I decide to give them something of an ultimatum, because there is absolutely no doubt that I am getting scammed, and they just so happen to be in on it. Now, I know, I know, what I did next was just stupid. But please don't underestimate how angry I was and how I just refused to swallow my pride and walk away. 
So I turn to the older bloke and say something like, Look, man, let's just work this out. Ricky's got 20 quid of mine and I'm not stupid. I know what the crack is. I'm also not walking away without it, so let's just say you give me an eighth of that green there, and that way I don't have to file a police report saying some lad robbed me and ran into this flat. You get me? Big mistake. Massive mistake. Sometimes it really is just better to swallow your pride and walk away, especially if the only other option is throwing around threats that you're unlikely to back up. But in the heat of the moment, that's kind of what I did, and by kind of, well, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Upon hearing my police threat, the older bloke just sort of nods as if to say, fair shout, and gets up and walks over to the front door. I'm thinking, hang on, what's he doing? And when he locks the front door to the flat with a mortise lock and slides the key into his pocket, I just think, uh-oh. You can imagine what came next. The three younger lads jump me. I try my best to fight back, but as you can probably guess, three-on-one didn't give me a chance to throw so much as two or three solid punches before I was on the deck getting the absolute life kicked out of me. All to a soundtrack of, you come into my flat and threaten me not happening. But the worst part was when I just heard, grab his hand, keep him still. I'm still in the middle of struggling, but I managed to get just a glimpse of the older bloke with a dumbbell in his hand. I know what's coming. This fellow's going to smash my hand to bits with that weight, and I'm probably never going to be able to write or type properly ever again. Thankfully, he didn't go through with smashing my hand up. Instead, he does this faint thing right as I think he's going to do it, then laughs his head off when I let out this embarrassingly girly scream. After that, I'm quite literally thrown out of the flat and as I manage to bring myself to my feet, I look back to see that one of the lads has my bloody provisional driver's license in his hand. The wallet must have fallen out or been swiped during the kicking. Ah, well, now we know your name. And where you live. Go the filth, and you're a dead man. Now get lost. I wondered, but the story doesn't end there. It just gets much weirder and arguably much more terrifying. If I'd have just walked away with a bit of a bruised ego, I'd have saved myself a good kicking. However, in actually laying hands on me, these lads had made a huge mistake. I wasn't some gangster bound to a code of silence, and honestly, neither were they. I was from a big city, and I definitely wasn't scared of some small-town dealers. And if they thought they could just intimidate some kid into silence, they were dead wrong. Because the first place I go after I end up getting kicked out of the fellow's flat is the Bangor police station. I was just dead honest with them. I told them I got scammed trying to buy smoke, told them I'd been battered, with me thinking the whole time, they're going to go round up this bloke's flat, and they're going to know he's got drugs in there. The place stunk of them. And that's how I'm going to get my own back. Solid plan, right? And quick side note, for anyone who says I'm a coward, a grass, or a snitch for going to the police, wind your neck in, Tony Montana. This isn't the wire. This is real life, and you fight with anything you've got available to you. Only... It didn't quite turn out like that. I was hoping the police would knock round, nick the bloke and his underlings, and then I'd see massive drug busts in the papers for a week or something like that. But when the police got back in touch, they'd said they'd nicked a lad for assaulting me, but that he was going to plead guilty so it didn't look like I'd have to go to court or anything. They gave me some leaflets on getting over trauma, advised me to file a victims of crime compensation claim, and then that was that. Yeah, it was some small measure of revenge, but it wasn't quite the complete and utter takedown I'd been hoping for. That being said, it would turn out that I didn't have to lift a finger to get my own back on Ricky. His own people would do that for me. Not even seven days later, I'm doing a bit of food shopping down at Morrison's when... Who should I see? With a giant cast on his leg and bruises all over his face. But Ricky, of all people... Almost everyone I spoke to about it was like, well, that's some car man action right there. And they still might be right. 
It might have been a complete coincidence that one week the lad robs me, then the next. He's in a bloody thigh cast. Which, how I know it must have been a really bad break. Stranger things have happened, right? But there's the thing. I don't really believe in coincidences. I believe in cause and effect. I think the top dog down in that lower town flat was just that. Top dog in the area. And I think the trouble Ricky ended up causing him meant he was only a fanny hair away from being nicked for selling class A's. I think he was so angry that he had his little minions break Ricky's leg. I mean, how else do you explain his black eyes and all that? He slipped and fell in the path of an oncoming fun run? Pull the other one. But then, the thing that really tickled me, the thing that honestly made my blood run cold was this. If they were willing to do that to one of their own, they wouldn't bat an eyelid at the idea of doing the same to some other idiot student, would they? And it's only then did I realize how bloody lucky I'd really been. A few months after, I completely balls up my end of year exams, ended up dropping out and that was the end of that chapter. Needless to say, despite the relatively short amount of time I'd spent there, Bangor really did teach me a thing or two. They just turned out not quite to be the kinds of things I imagined when I arrived. I grew up in quite a large college town, and since the university here is of a pretty good standard, I figured I could save a ton of money by living with my parents while pursuing my studies. The only real trouble was that the campus was literally on the opposite side of town than we were, so getting to and from campus proved quite a chore sometimes. So between my mom, dad, and uncle, they divided up the week and each picked a day or two where they'd give me a ride home. I'll admit, it did make me feel like an 18-year-old preschooler sometimes, and I still feel like I missed out on the party scene in many ways, but that kind of lifestyle would have definitely hit my grades hard, so I have few regrets. There was one time, though, something I'd considered a serious close call, and if it wasn't for having to wait for a ride most nights, it never would have happened at all. So it was the second semester of my freshman year, it was about 4.30 and my uncle was due to come pick me up from the student parking lot. He normally arrived like 5 or 10 minutes late. Rush hour can't be helped, but after like 20 minutes of waiting, I decided to give him a call to see where he was at. Oh shoot, it's my day? Oh Lacey, I'm so sorry, please don't tell your mom, I'm on my way right now, I promise. He sends me. Hmm, no biggie, right? Sure, I was kind of annoyed, but if he was on his way... Waiting another half hour or so wouldn't be a problem. So I just sat my butt down on the curb, got out one of my textbooks, and started an impromptu study session. After about 20 minutes or so, the sun is almost set when I see the lights of a vehicle turning into the parking lot. But I'm disappointed to see that it's not my uncle. It's just this random white van that parks up and just sits there for a while. I figured it's a cleaning lady or a janitor or whatever, but... When the guy gets out, he was wearing plain clothes. We made some awkward accidental eye contact and that prompted him to say, Hey there. Being polite, I returned the greeting, thinking he's just going to carry on his way, but instead, he walks up to me and tried to carry on the conversation. Waiting for someone? He asked me. I just nodded, kind of shy at first, and he says, Me too, I'm waiting for my daughter. For the next few minutes, he engaged me in a casual conversation about the college and about his daughter. I didn't mind at first, but it was actually getting dark by that point, so I was getting more and more nervous about my uncle getting there and ended up kind of zoning in and out while I kept an eye out. Then he started to come closer. Ah, oh, look, it's going to rain, he pointed out. And he wasn't wrong. Those big dark rain clouds had been gathering as the sun went down, Another reason why I was worried about not getting a ride. Say, want to come take shelter in my van if the heavens open up? Immediately I got extra nervous when he mentioned owning a van because I'm pretty sure everyone's aware of the whole stereotype about kidnappers using vans and whatnot. So I try to remain polite, but at the same time, I give the guy a resounding no and was relieved when he seemed to just drop the subject immediately. 
but he doesn't give up. After a few minutes, he asked if I wanted to ride home. I was pretty confused. Like, wasn't he supposed to be waiting for his daughter? And when I asked him that, it was like he just remembered that, yeah, he was there waiting to give his daughter a ride. That's the point where the alarm bells start really going off. The guy was obviously lying to me, and in the worst attempt to, like, distract me from it or whatever, he starts telling me, You know, at first I thought you were my daughter. You look so much like her. I just nod, praying for my uncle to show up so I can get away from this creep. When he starts asking me, Hey, what's your name? Maybe you and her share a few classes. Then, as if he was heaven sent, I see my uncle's car appear at an intersection down the road away. Perfect timing. I mean, he legitimately couldn't have timed it any better. So I get up, wish the guy a good evening, then start walking to the entrance to the parking lot so I can just jump into my uncle's car. But as I try to walk past him, the van guy actually grabs me by the arm and stops me from walking away. Hey, I'm trying to talk to you here, the guy said, like I owed him my time. And no, if it wasn't for the fact that my uncle rolled into the parking lot, I'd have been in quite a bit of trouble. The guy only let go when he saw my uncle driving up, but by then, it was too late. I was so scared that I burst into tears. My uncle got out of his car and almost started like chasing the guy, demanding to know who he was. The guy just got back into his van and drove off, but I made sure to let certain faculty members know so that a safety announcement could be made or however the college dealt with threats like that. I wasn't even the only girl he tried to kidnap either, and the cops honed in on the guy because a previous complaint had been filed against him. And I suppose all's well that ends well, but at the same time, I was so very, very close to not being okay at all. Who knows? I might not have ever gone home that night, and I'm eternally grateful to my uncle for showing up just when he did. Okay, so this is going to be something of a wild ride, so strap in. I went to quite a well-known college in a major East Coast city. I was on a four-year course, and for my junior year, I ended up living with another student in an off-campus apartment. I didn't actually know the guy. He was a local, whereas I'm out from the Midwest. He seemed chill enough, and the room he was advertising in his big old apartment was a pretty sweet deal, so I ended up taking him up on his offer. I don't want to give this guy's identity away. I made him a promise I intended to keep, so we'll just call him Rumi for the time being. At first, Rumi seemed like what you'd get if you gave human form to a cardboard box. The apartment was barely decorated, he barely talked to me, and he only ever ate the same flavor of ramen noodles in his room. Basically, people's idea of a dream roommate, but my god was he boring. The wildest he ever got was having his hockey bro buddies over to watch the Rangers, but even his buddies seemed about as exciting as gray paint. Me, on the other hand, I'm quite an outgoing person. A social butterfly, as my girlfriend at the time called it. Although you can bet your butt, I objected to the term. So as much as it was cool to live with Casper, the friendly roommate, it did kind of get tedious. Living with him was great if all I wanted to do was study or work on assignments, but it wasn't like I was getting any decent anecdotes out of living with the guy. At least, that's what I wrongfully assumed anyway. So this one night, I'm out bar hopping with my girlfriend and her best friend, and like most of the other college kids, we're doing so off campus. As we're moving from place to place, we start getting closer and closer to the city's alternative side. I think all it took was hearing one bar playing Lady Gaga before my girlfriend was freaking out and wanting to go dance. Okay, not my idea of fun, but if they sold beer, I didn't care where we went. So we walk into this gay bar where the girls have to pay cover, but yours truly gets in free. So I'm already laughing like best place ever. When I see they have the freaking Colts on TV behind the bar. Dude, $2 Heineken, no cover charge, and the Colts on TV. 
I thought the girls were going to have to drag me into that place, but it was looking more like they were going to have to drag me out of the place once they were done dancing. But anyway, I buy a few beers, sipping away while my girlfriend dances and I catch up on the cult highlights, when eventually I need to pee. So I get up, head off to the bathroom, but blocking the hallway are these two dudes who are absolutely sucking faces off of one another. I mean, they were just going at it, totally unable to hear me saying, excuse me, gentlemen, over and over again. I don't want to, like, scream at the dudes or anything. I'm not a jerk, so I ended up tapping one of the dudes on the shoulder like, dude, come on, let a guy pass. The guy turns around to look at me, a genuine bona fide leather daddy, I believe they're called, and he looks like he's seen a ghost. Because out of all the people in this huge freaking city who should be staring at me over his knockoff aviators, it's Rumi. I'm halfway through saying, dude, I had no idea, when he just makes a beeline for the rear exit of the bar. It's pretty obvious what the deal is. He's still in the closet, but no one on the college or family side of his life knew it. So I'm shouting, dude, Rumi, don't worry, bro, I won't tell. But nope, he just ghosts, leaving me standing there having totally forgotten about the pee I needed. The guy he'd been making out with is like, let me guess, you're the ex, right? I respond, I'm straight, bro, he's my roommate. I didn't even know he was gay. The guy rolls his eyes like I was totally lying about it, then walks off. But I am shell-shocked. You might call me homophobic or whatever, but I just didn't really think that there were gay guys like that. In all my ignorance, I just kind of assumed like, if you're gay, you're flamboyant, however you want to put it. I'm sorry if that sounds terrible, I just didn't know. But monosyllabic East Coast hockey bros could be gay? Dude, my mind was blown. Then, I don't know, it kind of made me a little sad. You gotta own yourself, you know? Embrace what you are. A person will never be really happy otherwise. So, I'm kind of drunk, explaining this to my girlfriend who is just like, what? And I make up my mind that I'm going to buy some beer, go back to the apartment, and then talk to Rumi about what happened. I was planning on saying all that to him, all poetic and free-thinking and progressive, and then we were going to hug it out and we'd be best friends forever. But I most certainly wasn't ready for his reaction when I tried to talk to him about it. He didn't come home that night, so it wasn't until the following afternoon that we next saw each other. I wake up, feel like death from having drank the entire fifth of Jameson and six-pack that I was planning on sharing with the roomie, and shuffle into the kitchen area to find him eating at the table. Immediately he gets up and walks his noodle cup into his bedroom. I don't like call after him or anything, not at first anyways. Jesus, I think my skull would have cracked open like an egg if I'd made any sound over 10 decibels. So, I wait until I've had some coffee and a stale donut, then I knock on his bedroom door. I hear, What? So I respond with, Dude, I think we should talk about what happened last night. Maybe clear the air a little? Silence. Not even so much as a mouse fart in there, and it's a silence that goes on for so long that, well... I just sort of carried on talking, babbling about how I'm not going to say anything to anyone, but that he should really think about coming out of the closet for his own mental health or whatever. As soon as I mention the closet, I hear movement on the other side of the door, and I assume it's him having decided to come out and talk, which, in a way, he had. The door flies open, and out flies Rumi, hockey stick in hand. No. I got the beer fear real bad, so I'm jumping back away from the door almost as soon as he opened it, giving me enough distance between us that I managed to keep him at arms, or should that be sticks length, all while he went on this big rant about me not telling a freaking soul about what I'd seen. Now that I'm typing this up, I guess there are some people that might think this is kind of funny, getting chased around an apartment by a closeted gay guy with a hockey stick. And yeah, I suppose that is kind of a funny image, but let me quickly and firmly reassure you that there was nothing remotely amusing in the moment. Because Rumi wasn't just angry, he had murder in his eyes. Anyway, he's chasing me around, barking out stuff like, 
I swear to God, if you ever breathe the word of what you saw ever, I'll end you. His voice was quivering while he was shouting it, and it made me realize something that scared me even more. He was way more scared of being outed than he was of anything else in the world. And I mean anything. You could just tell. And when a man is that scared, when he feels that backed into a corner, he is more than capable of doing terrible, violent things. I told him no, I swore to him that I'd never, never give away a secret, and that's a promise I've kept, and one I'll always keep. Not because I'm scared of what he'll do, because it's the right thing to do. But please don't let that give you the impression that I'm not scared of Rumi because I was, and still am. I thought he took me at my word, I really did, and after that, things slowly got back to normal. Better than normal sometimes, like when he ordered takeout for both of us and covered my half when I was broke. Weird behavior for him, but who turns their nose up to free food? Not me, that's for sure. Things were looking up. Rumi was acting chill again. And so, what exactly had me moving onto my girlfriend's couch for two months with nothing but a few changes of underwear just days before that takeout incident? The answer lies in a little white plastic shopping bag that should have been in the recycling can. So, like I said, something like three days after he ordered me bulgogi, I'm taking our trash down to the dumpsters around the back of the apartments. There's a big green dumpster for general trash, and then there's a smaller blue one for recycling metals, plastics, and stuff like that. Environmental stuff like that is, like, the only thing I'm woke about, so when I see a plastic bag in it with the general waste, I'm like, come on, Rumi, we talked about this. I reach in there, grab the bag, and as I do, a receipt falls out of it and onto the concrete. Naturally, I bend down to pick it up, seeing that it's from Home Depot of all places. I didn't think Rumi had any interest in DIY at all, not if his sense of interior design was anything to go by, so what was he doing down at Home Depot? Then, as I uncrinkle the thing to see what he bought, I feel my heart just about skip a beat. Hacksaw times one equals 695. Rumi had bought a freaking hacksaw. And what in God's name did he need a freaking hacksaw for? He was doing a PhD in forensic psychology, for God's sakes. Seriously, just for a second, put yourself in my shoes. Do you risk it? Do you honestly carry on living in that apartment with a dude who's already threatened you with violence? Who is for some reason now buying you things to keep you sweet, while also investing in the one thing he'll need to dismember you? and thus keep his secret safely buried with your bones? I've had people accuse me of homophobia over this in the past, but I couldn't care less if he was gay or not. He had a secret that he was terrified of people learning. It doesn't matter if he was cheating on his girlfriend or if he was into this weird clip-clop 4chan stuff. What mattered is that he was obviously willing to hurt me to keep it quiet. And yes, I know I might have just been blowing the whole thing out of proportion, Maybe one of his hockey bros threw that bag in the trash and that's how it got in the general waste to begin with. Maybe I just came over all paranoid and there was a perfectly innocent explanation for his behavior. But, like I said, is that really the kind of chance you want to take really now? Or is sleeping on a crummy folded out couch a small price to pay for knowing you're not just going to end up as a murderpedia entry? I attended India's National Defense Academy in Pune, Maharashtra. It's basically like India's version of West Point. There are some minor differences, but both serve as our respective nation's premier military academies, so that's the easiest way to explain it. It was the middle of my second term in my first year at the NDA, and we were all free to go home for the three-week break. However, instead of driving the almost 2,000-mile road trip, I decided to just stay in Pune and sign up for a three-week skydiving course instead. Seeing as I had aspirations of being a pararescue operator, flying up and jumping out in broad daylight was not a huge deal. The first week of training was confined to the hangars and involved a lot of safety drills, theory, and fail-safe procedures. 
It got kind of tiresome doing them over and over again, but we just needed to remind ourselves of the consequences, and suddenly finding our focus wasn't so difficult anymore. The first jump was a tandem jump with an instructor, and as much as it was a huge thrill, it got me looking forward to some actual solo jumps where I'd be free-falling on my own. The second jump was solo and gave me a first-hand experience of the vast blue skies and how it feels to be just above everyone else, literally. The third jump was a cakewalk as well. But as they say, the scariest things are usually the ones which we had not experienced yet, and I had no clue that jumping off of a plane at night would raise every single hair of my body for such a long time afterward. The night jump was compulsory if we were to complete the course, and honestly, I had no clue that it would be like falling into an abyss and would turn out to be the single most terrifying few moments of my entire life. Don't quote me on the exact numbers, as this all happened 10 years ago now, but we took off at around 0230 hours and in around 20 minutes had slowly climbed up to a height of approximately 13,000 feet. In preparation for our jump, the plane slowed down substantially and the jump master gave us a five minute warning. Then, when the door was slid open, we got the 60 second warning and all stood there, watching the little red light, feeling our hearts begin to race as we waited for it to turn green. Then suddenly, go, 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 go. There was a rush of movement and I saw people in front of me jumping one by one, shouting something which I could not hear due to the loud propellers and the wind. Until this time, I had felt really confident and I was only slightly nervous since it was my fourth jump by that point. But suddenly, it was the complete opposite. I saw the darkness outside, and the fear hit me like a rushing bull. As I said, the fear really began when I reached the door and saw what lay outside the plane. Or more correctly, what I couldn't see. If you could picture nothing, it is what I saw that time an infinite nothingness. We were jumping in a very rural area, you see. A place with not very much built up areas. This was great in one sense because we wouldn't accidentally be jumping onto power lines to die a horrible death from electricity burns. But it also had this completely unexpected effect on me. One of pure terror. And for a moment, it was almost as if I wasn't jumping out of a plane at all. More like death herself was waiting to engulf me into her deep, dark embrace. But what other choice did I have? I was the last one in line and if you fail one single parachute jump, you don't pass the course. I jumped. I had to. I screamed. And I kept screaming, trying to scream away the fear as I felt myself plummeting into the abyss below. Suddenly, a layer of haze pierced through me and then another. There was no end to it. Time had stopped for me and I felt so scared that I just let go and felt myself peeing my pants. I was still falling down, down towards the earth at speeds that none of my organs were ever used to. I wanted it to end but it was not under my control anymore. I guess this was the worst situation to be in life, without control over yourself or your surroundings. I was so scared that I could not even remember things I wanted to remember in my final moments. Time was still frozen. Suddenly, another layer of haze cleared and I finally saw specks of light in the distance. I had not even once looked at my height indicator. I was not in a state to. But seeing those lights helped me orient myself a little bit and gave me a sense of space. Then, bang. I pulled the cord and my chute opens and I finally begin to be slowed down. From there on, it was all about my patience and my fear battling each other till I had landed abruptly on some farm outside a village. I was supposed to target a particular settlement of lights, but in the rush of terror, I had completely failed to navigate myself properly. I know this isn't as scary as some of the other stories about haunted universities and whatever, but I can only say that I am glad we didn't have a ghost at NDA. But for some reason I think that night jump was my own personal brush with death, and it haunts me for almost the same reasons. A fear so great that I would rather never have to experience it for the rest of my life.
So back when I was in my first year of university, the halls I was in were in this horseshoe-shaped building, with the rooms all around the edges. I was in the back of the building, so I had a room which overlooked all the other inward-facing rooms, as well as the dorm's garden in the middle, which was about 200 yards wide. It was quite a nice setup, really. Like if it was sunny out, you could look down and see who was hanging out in the garden. See who's having parties later on at night, or who's sneaking a cheeky doobie out their window. But ironically, it's that same little setup that's partially responsible for my single worst experience while at university. So, we're coming up to an end of year exams in late April, and it's a nice day out. I'm sat in my room, lo-fi music on, studying my balls off, when something catches my attention from across the garden. Some guys opened up his window, opened at about chest height, and it looked an awful lot like he was trying to climb up onto the ledge. It looked pretty dangerous given he was on the second floor, but eventually he manages it, and he's dangling his legs out the window, just sat there like he's having a chill time. I just assumed it was part of a dare or something, maybe a guy trying to impress his friend by being a total mad lad as they say but he wasn't waving at anyone or anything. No one was filming from below, and he wasn't looking over his shoulder like there was anyone in the room behind him. He just kept looking down, staring at the ground from below him like he was thinking about jumping. From my perspective, it obviously wasn't him trying to take his own life because he'd only sprained an ankle at worst from jumping from that height. So I'm thinking to myself, why in God's name would he want to escape his own dorm room? It's at that point that I get up, walk over to my window, and open it up. I shout out, Hey, dude, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? As soon as the words leave my mouth, he looks at me, and that's when I see he's got something tied around his neck. I don't know what I even shouted to him. I just panicked as he threw himself off the ledge. I couldn't bring myself to look at it. I just ran and grabbed my phone to call 911. I literally had the chance to stop it. I was the only other person to see him climb up onto his window ledge, and all I thought was that he was being an idiot. I should have known that it was final exam time that was ramping up the stress for everyone, and that some people just couldn't deal with it all on their own, but I just didn't think. He didn't survive, but I heard he didn't suffer at all. Broke his neck when whatever he used for a noose bought him out on him. Poor guy. I can't even remember his name either, but it caused a massive scandal at my university, and eventually they ended up putting up safety bars on the windows so you couldn't open them all the way. Not like they were prison bars or anything. They were quite discreet. But for me personally, they were a constant reminder of what had happened. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just a dollar a month on Patreon. And maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in huge compilations and save on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.